The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92000 010 195 AFSL 232 510, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks from Ensemble, and I'm thrilled to be bringing to you uh, the podcast Engine Room. It's devoted entirely to the practices or the business of the business of financial advice. Over the course of the next many months, we're going to be interviewing Australia's best independent boutique advice firms, their practice managers, their GMs, on what environment is conducive to being a best practice how they keep talent, how they attract talent, and what the future of financial advice is. It's the Engine Room Podcast. Welcome aboard. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Hi, my name's Andrew Rocks, and welcome to another edition of The Engine Room. I've got someone who I have known for many years. Uh, he probably knows a few skeletons in my closet um, today. And more importantly, runs one of Australia's largest, if not the largest, life insurance businesses in this country. Um, welcome to the engine room, Drew Burton. How are you? Thank you very much, Roxy. I don't know about how many skeletons I know or want to know, but I appreciate the intro. Well, that was just giving me free range for your okay. skeletons, Drew, so I think that's uh, that was a par for the course. But um, I suppose getting getting back to um, uh, yourself, and, and look, thanks for coming into our, our offices here in Sydney. Um, life insurance. Mm-hmm. Surely when you were going through school and, uh, and you know, you had this aspiration of what you wanted to do, and um, I'm sure you had high aspirations of your career, at any stage in your high school formations, did you think, I'm going to be a life insurance guy? I don't know that anyone does. Um, no, I, I mean, I was very interested in business, uh, first and foremost, and, and sort of did know that I wanted to be self-employed. Uh, so, that was a, a key driver. And then, as with everyone in the life insurance industry, sort of somehow found my way here. So, maybe on that, I mean, I'm very interested in, in the desire to be self-employed, but, but maybe give us a bit of a feel of, 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 of your backstory as far as, you know, where you started and what was the spark, yep. um, the day you fell in, quote unquote, to the industry, um, and, um, you know, what you've built um, over, you know, the, the ensuing 20 years. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I grew up one of three boys. Father is a professional tennis player. Uh, so, it was a pretty competitive environment, being the youngest of three, and had a pretty normal childhood, I suppose. Uh, very sporty. Um, went to uni, studied accounting, finance, uh, worked in equipment finance then, um, and was referring to my uh, business partner now of the last 17 years, Chris Mason. And one day we were chatting. I don't know how it came up. We were actually formerly roommates, uh, which was more disturbing, but we were having a chat and thought, you know, maybe we can come together, and and uh, and that was seventeen, eighteen years ago. So it's been it's been awesome, actually. So the moral of the story here, guys, is the way in which you scale up your business is just uh, find a, find an ex roommate and uh, see if you've got much in common. Oh, mate, he was there was there wasn't much in common. He was five, six years my senior, but what he did have is he had a massive Sony Trinitron. He had Chesterfield couches. He had the fridge. He probably had no money in the bank, but geez, it looked good. Yeah, well, I've, I've, I've interviewed Chris before, and if uh, you want to listen to Chris's backstory, um, uh, it's it's quite quite hilarious as well. Now, um, when did you um, kick off MBS, and what does it stand for? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think you know that, so that's pretty pretty loaded. So, um, Chris, Trevor, and David started MBS in in halfway through '06, right? Uh, and MBS was the uh, initials of the surname. I joined eighteen months later. Another B, so it didn't become MBBS or MBSB or whatever it might have been. Um, and then, yeah, somewhere along the journey, uh, which I'm sure we'll get to a bit later, when we decided to really scale up, um, it became Chris and I, and then now to, to more shareholders. And 
Your beginning journey with MBS, were you the run-of-the-mill life insurance, getting your own clients, or or from memory, there was a bit of a tie-in with accounting firms, I think was one of your, your thing, and I think sport has given your background, has played a real part in, in your business. Would that be correct? Yeah, certainly on the recruitment side, it appears. You know, we have a few... Uh, a few people who have been actively involved, a former professional golfer, another one that worked at a pro shop and and the like. But that that was certainly the early days when you're trying to get the right people together that, that fit culturally and, and sort of had the same sort of level of ambition and competitive spirit. I forget the, what was the first part of this question. Oh, I just wanted to know, did you start off as a traditional life insurance? Yeah, so- and, and, and what was the tie-in with accountants? Because over the years, I've, I sort of got the vibe that you, you managed to be able to become accountant whisperers, if that's even a thing. Um, and there's a lot of planners out there who, who really struggle with, with, uh, you know, the Rosetta Stone that is talking to accountants. And, and I believe from, from my anecdotal experience watching you guys that you seem to have pulled it off. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so we were first lo- licensed through Lonsdale, which was, uh, an AFSL that was more assisting accounting firms get into the wealth space. And, and they were very clear around uh, the need for life insurance and a lot of the wealth advisors inside accounting firms were dabbling in it and not really doing it properly. And so Lonsdale were really clear with them saying, if you don't address this risk, we encourage you to, uh, to refer it out. And so we were one of the firms in Sydney that that was re- the recipient of that. Um, there was a firm in Melbourne, CRA, who was sort of like a sister firm a few years ahead of us that we ended up acquiring uh, back in 2017 um, that also had the same origins. That's great that Lonsdale did it, but ultimately, yep. what drove what drove the ability for accountants to clearly identify and properly refer um, into your business? Because I, I find that there's a bit of a, a disconnect sometimes as far as they feel sometimes that they can be a bit transactional as opposed to building that deeper relationship. Yeah, it isn't. It isn't. It isn't. Um, where we see, so it's process driven. Where we see accountants that are, I, I suppose, in two buckets that we would view, there'll be those accountants that would have a, like somewhat of a fact find, right? Where they will know their clients' wills, banking relationships, mortgage relationships, etc. And those accountants are much more readily likely to to raise the need for life insurance or to say, Roxy, we think you should get this reviewed because we're aware of this, that or the other. And so um, we were really clear on on keeping it simple. And so what we would start with is let's have a look at your client's existing policies or if they start up an SMSF, then that's quite an obvious transition. Or if they're you know under the age of X and earning over Y, well, then they're clearly someone that we could look like we could help. And when, when you're on that, that pathway to where you are today, has there been any individuals that um, you think, geez, they've assisted me, or maybe a, a bit of a shout out? Actually, lots. Um, not to be broad brush, but we've always been, uh, we've always leaned on other people or asked people who have done things before us what they did. How is it like? You know, what mistakes did you make? You know, we've all made plenty of mistakes. And it's that's- actually what we're doing right now is, uh, is, is doing that for others, Drew. So, yeah. So keep going. Yeah, and I, I suppose everyone's been really generous. Um, you know, we've had a wonderful working relationship with Macquarie uh, inside their van network that's been excellent. The principals community in Con Costas and his team, you know, similarly, that they're always happy to introduce you to other firms. You know, we've got a lot of joint ventures in play. So... We have, you know, leaned on people like Charlie Viola of Pitcher Partners, you know, who is reasonably prolific in what he does and understanding what processes mean to him and, and his team and how they engage with each other and with the clients. And so th- there's been lots of people really across the last 20 years that have been instrumental and very giving of their time. And when I think of the life insurance um, landscape as, as we speak, you know, when, when, when I got involved early on, it was very much um, a lot of older advisors were in life insurance, but I've seen a real sort of swing to, to more people that have got, you know, life insurance things going on. I mean, you, you're, you're a father with kids, you're going yep. through, you know, I imagine that, that peak life insurance requirement. Do you find that that's a lot of your team are, are in that zone? Uh, yeah, we'll be with. We've got sort of most of the shareholders are in their 30s or 40s. Um, most of the team are, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s. Yeah, there's probably a reasonable cross-section to be fair. But definitely when you're going through, you know, I'm a father of two, as you mentioned, my boys are, are 10 and 8. You know, I'm in the eye of the storm for the life insurance, right? You, where people typically have 
debt, you know, young family, maybe edu- education requirements and not a lot of wealth yet. Yeah, it's absolutely. And, and I find that that's, um, you know, uh, we, we were speaking off, off air earlier about sort of the, the makeup, the composition of your advice team and, and sort of as it's changed um, from both demographics and gender, which we'll get into a bit later, and that's probably playing into the whole, um, you know, identifying the people who can identify with that peak eye of the storm, as you say. Absolutely. So um, MBS started off um, doing life insurance. You then did some joint joint ventures. Yeah. Maybe explain sort of what do you mean by joint ventures? Because um, knowing Chris well, all I thought that was was he went and played golf with accountants. But clearly, um, you know, you being the brains and the operations um, behind the business, what did that actually mean? Yeah. So um, in 2015, so the business was 10 years old. 2015, uh, John Trowbridge came out and made the recommendations that you know we saw commissions reduce. We saw the cost of advice increase as a consequence. Uh, the education requirements obviously increase we we viewed the need for life insurance would remain right a few of these interventions were unforeseen certainly by us so we sort of had this moment of time where we thought maybe for 24 hours geez, this could be armageddon the answer for us is going to be scale so how do we deliver better outcomes for our clients for our referrers and for each other um, and so what we did is we started approaching some of these firms that were doing it in part. So, you know, wealth advisors have been comfortable in, in the recommendation of an insurance portfolio, but it's the execution component that we view so commonly as, as being not their strength. You know, it's tough and we believe in specialization. We've never done anything else. We've never done mortgage broking. We've done general insurance, wealth, nothing else aside from the specialty that is life insurance advice. So we approach these, these businesses and we ended up acquiring uh, somewhere between 50 and 80% of their life insurance operation, um, which would mean that we would second advisors into their office. We would put it power planners and, and client services in their office. We would okay, well, well, just, just let's take a step the, back because that, yeah, that's uh, – yeah, wow. Um, so initially you had a referral partnership, which many of the listeners would, would have, and, and I imagine there might have been a, com- a commercial component of yep. that. Um, the, the recommendations came down and all of a sudden um, what was an 80% um, up front for a hybrid commission went to 60% and, and um, you know, you had to put your engine room hat on and go, well, how do we efficiently deliver this? Because if we're paying cost of goods to acquire the client, um, we're going to run out of, uh, out of sort of oxygen. When, and so then you made the decision to then go and acquire the businesses of the people that you were joint venturing with and joint venture in a more meaningful commercial fashion. Is that right? Yeah. So, you know, again, we believed in the need for life insurance, but we didn't like the changes that were being brought in because we hadn't planned for them. Well, nine years later, it's, it's played out in the worst possible way. You know, there's, 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 there's just a massive, massive gap in the yeah. market. Yeah. So what we recognized is, you know, we could either keep remonstrating about it or we could get on with it really. And again, the wealth advisors were in a terrific place to recognize the need, but we did believe that scale was going to help with advice. It was certainly going to help with buying power with insurers, with having dedicated relationships, being an underwriting or pricing structures or claims team, absolutely. So we went into those firms and we'd either white label the proposition, so we'd use their brand. I mentioned Charlie from Pitches before. Were they the first one that you did that secondment and embedding with? Uh, they were prime uh, advisory in Chatswood were maybe beat them by one or two months. Yep. Um, and, and that model we've had, we've maintained our brand. So MBS is the outward brand to their clients, whereas Pitches in that example – uh, Pitch Partners Insurance Sydney um, is the brand. And and so they had an existing need. And the benefit of that for us was that they had clients renewing on a monthly and quarterly basis, which would get our advisors constantly engaged with the wealth advisor or with the accountants. And so there was a, there was a cadence of which you talked about earlier that, that helped propel. And in reality, the, the buying power now of, of where we're at is – we can deliver a better outcome sincerely than what they're able to deliver themselves. And that momentum is super powerful, right? They'll recognize we'll get a new client on board, be it, you know, someone looking for buy, sell, key person or a family looking for personal cover. And we'll review their existing policies and we'll provide them with, you know, information so they can make an informed decision. 
And um, you mentioned uh, that you just wanted to get on with it, so to speak. Yeah. So maybe just changing gears a little bit and finding out a bit more about your business. What's the the the, the, the definition of getting on with it? How how big is MBS now, as far as you know, client numbers or, or, or premium? And um, because I know that you got on with it, it'd be great for our listeners to actually hear just the the scale from that decision in two thousand and fifteen. Yeah. To to where we are today. Yeah. So I think we did things okay. For the first 10 years, to be fair, we weren't like we did our best, but we probably could have run harder. Um, we did have some time on the golf course and we did have some nice work life balance. But then the, the changes to the industry came about and we had around 1500 clients. That was 2000, January, February 2016, and we now have 13,000. So it's been a, a nice period of growth. It hasn't felt overwhelming because we've we've tried to sort of have that balanced approach across all layers of the business. And really, we're working with typically really good wealth and accounting firms that are the primary relationship holders of the client. So we sort of come in there as a secondary advice business. So is that what you call yourself? As you call like a second chair or or secondary? Or what's 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 you, how do you work with them? Because they're doing the strategy and they're yeah. the primary. And are you like their execution partner or, or yeah? So that, or? it's not that they're doing the life insurance strategy. You know our advice. No, their overall strategy sure. with the client. Yeah, they're certainly doing the relationship. Yeah. So we're going and complementing what they do. So the primary product that those clients have with the firm would be either be accounting or wealth. And so we're coming in giving specialized advice in a in a a subset of the requirement for that client. And so yeah, we do see ourselves as a a secondary advice firm that is that is complementing the delivery. And for that, I mean really it was a good way for us as well to have internal governance as required because if we're carrying their brand or we're carrying their relationship, you know, we need to operate akin to the professionalism that they have. Well, so, it's time to play first grade because, you you know, if you're up under a national brand like a Pitchers, for instance, or, yep. or several of the other wealth ones, um, and you mentioned that, that anyone can 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 sell the concept of, of, of life insurance, but it's the operations, it's the execution, it's the the you know the claims management, the the, the, the whole thing that that you really need to get scale for, in your opinion, um, in order to be able to deliver to those partners. Yeah, and some peer to peer as well. If you're a, a life insurance advisor, you're working inside a firm that is either a general insurer by heart or or a wealth firm, and you're one of one or one of two or three, you certainly don't get that community engagement that you have with other advisors. You know, you yourself would, I'm sure, benefit from speaking to colleagues and peers across the industry. And for our advisors, we've got 23 ARs. It's it's a nice environment for them to talk about what's happening in underwriting, what's happening in product, how we're we working with our firms, how we're we working with our clients. So um, that sort of success, you know, breeds success if you've got the right people for sure. And you mentioned that um, some of your advisors are seconded um, and you just gave me the headline of, of the amount of ARs that you've got being 23. Yeah. When it gets down to the the engine room of how you and your team then work out how to deliver it, how are they structured? Is it is it in pods? Is it are they allocated to JV partners? Do they run their own PLs? Just be good to sort of flesh out. Um, and how are they supported? Is it at an individual level collectively? Big question, but I'm sure that you can handle it. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, we've just gone away from pods. Like, okay, we've tried lots of things, and many have worked, and many have not worked. We thought pods would be a great way for a more collaborative, uh, connected, intimate approach. Um, it probably got teams a bit disjointed, and so uh, we've gone away from pods. So where are you moment. today? What's 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 the uh, the current state or the, the new new co of, of operations? So it's it's more it's more that people working within an office, so a location, you know. Be it Perth or Melbourne or Sydney or wherever it may well, be. Great, great opportunities to ask. Where yeah. are you located? Our engine room, as you say, is in is in uh, Perth, Melbourne, and Sydney. Um, Brisbane, Hobart, and Canberra is also our presence as well. Um, not yet in South Australia or or NT, but um, you know, opportunity might lead there one day. But there's no immediate plans. And um, so they're now arranged within the geographical office. Is that that's what you've indicated? Correct. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, what does it look like if I'm an advisor in that office? Yeah. Um, do I have a, a sort of an associate advisor or what, what, what's the headcount of the balance of the people in your organisation? Yeah, so we have uh, this around 55 in yep. the team. Um, we have advisors, we have advisor associates, 
We don't call them power planners because we think it's integral that the advisor creates the strategy yep. and does the research. They might be assisted in doing the research, but ultimately it's their advice and advice is our commodity. You know, like we get preferential treatment with regards to pricing, but we can't get away from the advice component as, yep. as the key item. Uh, we have client services. We have one team that's probably different than what we've seen elsewhere, and that's an advice compliance team. So we have nine working in the advice compliance team, and what they do is is they review the advice and they review the advice document and they audit it and they audit the file before it ever goes to a client. So you're getting fulfilling two functions. One is a double check, so to speak, and then you're proactively doing your audits for the purposes of your AFSL requirements as well, I imagine. We still need external audits and we yep. still get them. Yep. Um, but we manage other people's brands, you know, and we manage as a secondary advice business. It's important that the quality of our advice is to what we what we committed to be. That's it. So you've, you're self-licensed um, and, you know, we were talking off air, I think, when we had a chat last week about about the tech stack and, and there's been um, – you know, there's been headwinds in life insurance, I suppose, over you know quite a few years for new business, and that's just the cost of the cost of actually delivering that. And you guys are at the at the, the pointy end of efficiency. Um, but what what's your tech stack currently look like, given your uh, life insurance specific um, business? Uh, it's been very challenged. It uh, we've used sales roll in the therapy. <laughs> yeah, correct. Well, you know, nothing ventured, nothing gained. Um, we certainly have. Have uh, have spent some money on it, um, not always with the best outcome. So um, that doesn't mean we will stop. So we have Salesforce, and that that has been very beneficial, particularly when we've got sort of partner environments being joint ventures or referral parties that we want to provide the right sort of visibility and transparency. So you provide you provide sort of um, a live partner portal or yep. something like that. Is that right? And 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 Salesforce because they are. A- across a bunch of different industries are well-known and, and facilitate that. Correct. Yeah. Um, we use X-Plan as yeah. well for our research. Um, and there is there is a, a platform that is coming to the market that you're aware of called LifeBid. And, and we are supporting LifeBid because we see – we're upset and disappointed that the industry to date doesn't have a platform with renewals – that makes the management of existing policyholders easier. Um, it's very disjointed and, and certainly harder for those doing sort of advice of life insurance on the side and, and it's hard for specialists as well. So we're not having the same luxury that, that wealth advisors would have from that perspective. And so, you know, we think this is something that's uh, long overdue. And I was at a, a forum uh, only last week and I think – Either yourself, one of your peers, almost said it's it's it's, it's been it's embarrassing, sort of that it's taken this long for 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 a technology or a tech stack to catch up with the fact that that you don't just write a piece of life insurance, but you've got to renew them. You've got to have efficiencies around managing it, and when you've got thirteen thousand people um, looking to renew and circumstances change, this is without even going on claims, running it through what historically is a, an investment based sort of um, piece of software or, or, or software tech, tech, you've had to do a lot of workarounds, which I imagine is part of that, you know, you've wasted some money. Yeah, comment. absolutely. Um, because insurance is not a set and forget outcome, right? So you need to manage those existing policy holders. And, you know, we talked about the regulatory intervention earlier. The premium increases for clients have been incredibly high, right? And of course, this well-known that the distribution has been steadily declining or consistently and persistently declining over, you know, over the last six, seven years. Um, with, you know, lower interest rate environments, we're seeing, insur- we're seeing premiums increase significantly. You know, now we understand it's CPI that's increasing the sum insured and the premium significantly. So, yeah, what we've got um, – what we do is we look at every policy that renews from a tech perspective every month – and we look at the percentage increases. We more keenly look at the percentage increases per insurer that are increasing for the first three years of a product life, policy life, and after that to try and gain trends and try and look to see who's being more sustainable in the current time and having relationships at a CEO to CEO conversation perspective to try and fix that. And given the magnitude of the numbers we're talking about, you, you, you're talking about more than a thousand policies per month. Yeah. 
that are um, that are, are getting to a call to action stage, and I imagine you've got to be, you know, a couple of months before that as far as their diagnosis and and recommendations. So, is that is that one of the largest parts of your your sort of strategic thinking in, in your role? Yeah, yeah. personally, yeah. What, or have you deployed sort of the accountability that to other team members within your org chart? Oh, we have a CFO, um, uh, Grant McLennan, who. Is, is very handy on the tech and the analytics and certainly using that information that he's able to curate to have those conversations with insurers to say, hey, what we're seeking is definitely a better outcome for our clients. So yeah. something more sustainable, something more predictable because, you know, we have seen um, upfront discounts either uh, embedded or, you know, been able to be turned on, turned off in yeah. policies and, and we're challenged by that. Well, they have that in, in, in the home loan um, world as well with things like cashbacks and um, uh, it potentially creates an activity which is which is costly and counterproductive. And um, uh, for the people listening that are on the product side, um, uh, it's it, it, trying to make it easier for the, the dwindling amount of people who really support you would probably be a very good idea. But I'm, yeah. sure you, I'm sure you know that. And so, you know, the scale assists with the amount of advice and the, you know, national relationships in terms of distribution – but the scale helps with actually having proper conversations with insurers as well um, and trying to work together. So there are factors. I mean, it's not me blaming insurers. There are ingredients that cause the outcome, absolutely. And so we need to understand things such as, you know, their point of sale acceptance rates. Like how can we make it more efficient for them to receive applications from us? Yep. How can we make it more efficient to go through the underwriting process? And, you know, we have a head of advice, Chris McKenzie, who has been prolific and he's a particularly process oriented individual. And so he spends a lot of time working with underwriters, working with, um, you know, the premium service team to try and make their cost in delivering for our clients lower. And I find it surprising that we're talking – you know, inherently, you're not a small business anymore, but you, you, you run, you've got a small business mentality as far as problem solving and whatnot. And, um, it's the advice side of it that are going to the insurers, um, talking about how to generate efficiencies, which is a win-win. Um, is there a, you know, from, from the insurance companies that are out there and, and, um, uh, is there any ones in particular that, that, that have worked well for you as far as from a strategic perspective and from a dialogue perspective? Yeah, the certainly our the support in terms of the willingness to engage in this sort of a process with with AIA Talon Zurich, they've been standouts absolutely, and that they've got scale. They are also viewing an industry that um, is going in the wrong direction in terms of distribution. Um, so hopefully, they can uh, we can work together for the betterment of others beyond just MBS. Absolutely, um, and I'm not saying that from a charity perspective but the clients of our our clients need a stronger industry as well we need a stronger industry absolutely because that will create a, a layer of stability a, a layer of premium certainty and, and certain profitability for insurers that that this should flow through now i'm here listening to um what you're doing at a macro level and and i completely understand why uh, advice practices out there who might be doing life insurance as a as well as sort of five to ten percent of the time, um, they're just going to struggle to have the headspace and the scale to be able to have those mature conversations. Is that kind of your gateway into um, meeting with these practices? And by the way, are you, are you still open to to new partnerships? Yeah, absolutely, we are. Yeah, I mean we we sort of look at a few things in our business in terms of our operational infrastructure. Um, we're at 120 million in client premium now you know we'd hope to get to 300 million over the next five years and it will be through partnering up with firms it will be through the acquisition of going concerns with with people who aren't who aren't transitioning necessarily on the way out we of course will be a a succession plan absolutely to some um and keen for that but uh we do recognize the benefits of scale um so when we look for a joint venture partner you know we're, we're looking for three key ingredients we're looking for there has to be alignment you know there's they talk about the sydney swans and their sort of approach to you can say no dickheads policy yeah, i don't um, think we've got rules do we sound guy no that's him nodding that's sound that's guy nodding, nodding yeah <laughs> that's an affirmative yeah i mean you've got to be aligned like, life's too short not to be working with the people that you want to work with so yep. we've got to find partners that that value us that we value that we work and and operate um, in a way that's 
you know, consistent to each other and that we want to have a beer with, quite honestly. Like life's a bit too short with with trying to have phone calls you're trying to avoid. So the first thing is that there needs to be some natural alignment and part of that is also growth. We want to work with firms that have an ambition to grow, that aren't standing still, um, that have aspirations for something bigger than, than today. And that's the mindset of the principles fundamentally. Looking, yeah. to, looking to you know be better tomorrow than what they are today. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, and and we'd also we're also looking for firms that have it, have done it already. So yeah. if they've got any, as mentioned before, if they've got an existing portfolio, that means they've got clients renewing every week, every month, every quarter, and it just creates much better engagement between our team and their team. And um, harking back to the very beginning, you, you, yourself and Chris, there's way more in the in the C-suite of your business at the moment. Yep. Maybe gets a bit of a feel for sort of who 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 operates their business. And do you have a board or an advisory board? It'd be good to get a feel for the governance of, of the firm. Yeah, we do. Um, I, I'm not sure who the individual was. I think he he was from memory. Uh, he was a loud American fellow from Yum Foods that owned KFC and Pizza Hut, and but he he made a he made a comment. Um, at a function that if you're a growing business, the one thing he would recommend is that you, let's say you've got a role that requires someone for $100,000, go and find someone that's worth $150,000, pay them $150,000 and back them to cover that spread. And, you know, this sort of leads into our COO, Carolyn Clark, um, who came from our golf club which she'd been at our golf club for 24 years. Um, she would have been there when she was 10. So, uh, <laughs> um, But she, she came to the business because we recognized that she had a skill set that was different to ours. So she was managing 60 staff at the time. She was managing- uh, And how, how many head count were you when you uh, took Carolyn on? Maybe 14. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so you've done that. You've basically, you, you've, bought, you've bought future. Absolutely. Yeah. But she also was managing- different line functions. So she was managing a hospitality. She was managing uh, the like receptions, weddings and what have you, events, I should say. And she was also managing the golf club or golf course. Um, so she had a she had a membership group. So a bunch, of, was, bunch of inpatient, A-type yeah. personalities. And so she could handle that. <laughs> she could handle us. And so we've made, deliberately made hires like that. Yep. And I mentioned Grant earlier. He was very similar. Um, you know, in the early days, we were particularly clear about just getting the right people, irrespective of experience. Um, whereas now we have, we're now trying to find the right people with the necessary experience that can help us get to the next stage. Well, that, that's a great segue. And um, one of the things you mentioned was um, uh, we'll get into the people side of it. And you mentioned you like to have, uh, you know, people you can have a beer with. And um, our personal history, um, uh, we, we do play sport together, but um, I'm probably the only decent skill I have is the beer at the end of the match. So um, I'd like to thank publicly um, all the additional running that, that Drew has done for our team over the last 10 years to facilitate the beers at the end. So um, it is a people game. Yep. And, um, you know, long after the result has been forgotten, you remember the people who are you doing it with. Is Absolutely. Thoughts. And the genuineness, right? You want to be working with people with that you want to hang a, have a beer with because they're authentic and because you actually enjoy it rather than for any other ulterior motive. Yeah, you spend a lot of time with them. So why then do people join MBS? Yeah. Why do they stay and how do you grow together? People join MBS. If you're an advisor, we have a clear pathway to equity. So... Um, we do recognise. Let's flesh that out. Yeah. What does that mean without numbers or people? But what gives a feel for it? I, I, Andrew Rocks, God forbid, joins up. My got a history of doing um, Australian Casualty and Life, Lifetime, Lifetime Income Protections yeah. back in the nineteen seventies. All um, very relevant. Yep, yep. There you go. Um, so, and, and how, what, what does what does that pathway look like for a young, um, bright, reasonably handsome guy? Transparency, right? So we will say to them, "This is what, as an organisation, we expect." from you and this is our commitment on the other side and so everyone is aware of the level of you know we have sort of somewhat of a balanced scorecard right and yep. of course the compliance needs to be your critical numbers of course your numbers you based yeah and so and so we have that approach and we give them a clear visibility of what we would expect for them until we would offer them then the opportunity to buy into the business and, and what, they what are the elements then you've got you've obviously got compliance yeah um, I imagine they're 
they have to deal with those partners if they're assigned? Correct. We expect we expect that they will appropriately and professionally engage with the referring firms or joint yep. venture firms they're working with. We absolutely want to see them working well with their team. Yep. Um, we want to see them working well with insurers and what that means, it might sound a little bit unusual to say that, but we distribute insurers' products so we don't tolerate – People picking up the phone and abusing an insurer or someone who works there. Well, they're kind they, of quasi part of your team. Well, they might not. You, know, you don't always agree. You don't agree with an insurer yep. often, but we need to maintain a level of professionalism because, in the end, we're going to need them to pay a claim or we're going to need them for the next policy or whatever it may be. And then we expect that they will have a certain level of activity. So we don't look at dollars. Yep. We look at the number of lives insured. Yep. So we're not seeking for them to hit, you know, to because they'll prioritize then a bigger case over a smaller case in terms of dollars when to the accounting firm or the wealth firm, that might be a key client that only needs a small amount of cover. And so we can't have them persuade or, or consciously or subconsciously driven to write bigger policies, what we need to see is activity. So we, we, we want to insure people. And so so then if you've, if you've got those 360 feedbacks yeah. after a period of time, then, then um, you know, what, what's the methodology? Is it, is it um, synthesized equity? Is it ESOP? Is it actual equity? What, 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 does, what does the MBS playbook look like, if you don't mind me asking? It's actual equity. So they would... Um, they would set up a perhaps you know more commonly a family trust, and they would borrow the buy-in. Yeah, okay. And so how, that, how many shareholders do you say so you've got? Fifty-five team members, and some of them would be recent hires, and some yep. of them have been there forever. What's the shareholder f- footprint look like? Yeah. Sorry, one last comment to that, and we would guarantee the debt because for a younger person, you know, maybe in their thirties or maybe in their forties, that that might have young children, might have a, a mortgage, or maybe they're looking to, to buy a so home. So you're not crimping their borrowing capacity to buy a house. Our basically. Yeah, correct. Yeah. We want to support it. Yeah. Um so And you're also backing your own business. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And the business also, you know, it needs to be a worthwhile investment for them as well. Yeah. So we'll be transparent with them, you know, not just you know, just in time, in the days or weeks before uh, they are offered the opportunity to, to to buy in, but we will want them to have full comprehensive knowledge of the business financials and the investment they're making in the business um, from that perspective, and the opportunity to talk to their accountants and have their accountants engage with our accountants. There's a level absolutely. of transparency on the on yeah. the P and L and and where you guys are going, but you know. Given the nature of your business, most of them who have a calculator can probably work it out to a certain extent. So um, I imagine they'd be quite enthusiastic given that opportunity. Yeah. Um, so we have uh, 10 shareholders yep. um, currently, and we also have bought on a capital partner, a US group called yep. Merchant, which have assisted in in strengthening our balance sheet. Um, so what that means is they've they've – taking care of Macquarie's debt for the moment um, and given us the opportunity for a bit of a reset moment. So again, you know, none of the existing shareholders wanted to take money off the table or wanted to sell down, but what we wanted to do was strengthen our balance sheet for what we see as the next the next run of growth and, and investment and reinvestment. You know, we need to reinvest in our policies, in our tech stack, in our processes, in our talent. And we do believe um in acquired growth and organic growth, working together. And I believe that, that, that what you just mentioned there with, with the um, capital partner of Merchant, um, there are a lot of other capital partners out there and, and, yep. and, and um, uh, it, it really is the growing up of this industry. Yeah. You know, it's been wild that, that businesses um, in financial services haven't had um, you know, capital partners because at the end of the day, there's only a couple of ways to grow and that's debt. Um, or, or, or borrowings or, or, or equity, and there's only so much equity that can come from internal people. So, yeah. um, I think that's a pretty shrewd move. It's gonna it's gonna give you the firepower to be able to actually do that inorganic growth, um, as well as you know give you the ability to weather any storms that that potentially could be in the horizon. Yeah, absolutely. And they um and they were the right fit for us for a couple of reasons. You know, um, the two obvious ones were. You know, they've come in at 19.9% uh, ownership. Yep. But what they have done as well is, you know, they've they've filled that brief because we have sort of a 10 to 15-year plan and vision. Yep. None of us are sort of looking to, to exit out in the shorter term. And so um, we would have been very hesitant to do any 
any sort of uh, bringing any capital partner for a, a more material amount than than twenty percent or un, under that. Yep. And um, so you've now got so that would also bring with it um, uh, for the first time in uh, uh, I'll pick on your business partner Chris Mason's uh, career. You, you guys now have um, a, another board member, or is the nineteen point nine one below a board member? Yeah, no, they're, they uh, they're not on the board. Um, yeah. So we still have a board that that Chris and I. Uh, have control over in yep. terms of the nominations. Yep. Um, we have uh, Peter McKenzie, who is the chairman of our AFSL, yep. um, who has a great experience as being chairman of, of several super funds and an insurance lawyer by trade. Um, and so he brings a very good uh, level of experience and governance um, for our group. But we, uh, yeah, so it's it's still us for the moment. And um yeah, it's it's been enjoyable to date, and hopefully the the years ahead are equally enjoyable. Ah, sounds good. You've, you've always got to be moving forward. Now, getting back to your actual team. Yeah. Um, you mentioned they've got the offices. Um, you mentioned um, uh, you know your recruitment can come from a familiar place, or it could come from you know a, a, an acquisition of a going concern. Have we have like minded people? Um, but how on a daily basis, as far as running the operations, what's what's the cadence of the business? Do you guys, um, you know, do the teams meet daily? Do they have quarterly? Do they, you know, what what what's the what's the day to day rigor or, or cadence of, of of the beat business? Is this your way of asking? Do we do huddles? Well, it's huddle or cuddle. I'm not sure. It was sort of how progressive you are, but um, um, yeah, why not? Do you do huddles? Uh, so the ops team do huddles. Uh, they are not daily. The advisor team gets together quite frequently and does, you know, sort of one day where they're all in the office. I mean, mm-hmm. like others. We so this is in, in each of the individual offices? And, Correct. And then I, do you do sessions where they all come together? Correct. Yep. So, we, so we'll do once a month where they all come together. Okay. Uh, every 18 months or two years, the whole company gets together. Yep. Um, so the last one was at the Gold Coast. Yep. I bullishly announced the next one would be in Queenstown, which- We can't take that back now that we've recorded this. I know. Well, actually, I couldn't take it back because it was set in front of everyone. So we're- uh, Queenstown is a magical place. It's a cracking That's place. A it's really, really good. So, um, but it does bring you know it's challenges around what time of year do we have it there, and are we skiing? Are we not skiing? What does the insurance look like? All those sorts of things. The Gold Coast was actually because uh, no one lives on the Gold Coast. No one lives in Queenstown that works in our business, but that that worked really well. So what does fun look like? So you've got so you've got the the operations team uh, doing their operations. Do you do a um, so do they report up to um, Caroline at the COO level on a monthly basis as far as numbers? Or how do you get a, how do you get the pulse of the business through? Okay, so uh, the head of advice, Chris McKenzie, will work with the advisors, and he'll look at the performance, the training, and the education. And the recruitment of the See if there's any gaps there and make recommendations, yep. And and be pretty constant with that. He also has, uh, along with myself and our CEO, OO, Carolyn, have uh, a report twice a week from our advice compliance team. Yep. We want to understand as early as possible if things are happening or what's happening or what's not happening. And then Carolyn performs a similar role that Chris does for the advisors but within the ops team. Yep. Uh, What we look at from a high level is – we sort of look at five things on a quarterly basis run ongoing. And that is, so distribution being the first one. Do we have enough? Do we have too much? You know, do we want to seek out more? You know, what does it feel like? And there is an element of gut feel, right? Because it's you can't focus on everything at all times. The second part is we'll look at advisors. And, and similarly, advisors training, performance, uh, onboarding, offboarding, whatever it may be, do we have enough? Do we not have enough? Do we have too many? Um, then we'll look at the ops team as well. So this is sort of, you know, what I'm talking about is going through these five items on, you know, taking maybe 45 minutes. And so, so then the, They're the headlines that you have consistency with every time, yeah? Correct. Yep. And then so then we'll look to what area we're going to focus on yep. for the period of time. So the next, the next part, um, the fourth one will be, you know, systems, processes, tech. And so we're spending some money at the moment and we'll, we'll, we have got an 11-week project that is a significant revamp of our current Salesforce platform. Yep. And then the last one will be our insurer relationships. So 
Are we happy with our insurers? Are we not happy with our insurers? What do we need to work on with them? What are we looking to achieve? What's the premium renewals coming through and what do they look like? Um, so that sort of gives the management team the ability to say, okay, let's get aligned. You know, we've got a business and a management team that's of a reasonable size and you want people sticking in their lane. You want people focusing on what we need to be focused on at that time. Again, we can't be all things to all people. We can't do all things at all. Otherwise, we won't do anything well. So at the moment, um, there is uh, there is training of, of, of new team members that are coming on board. Um, we have uh, two advisors uh, that we've recently recruited. One started last week. One will start in, in two weeks. We have uh, three in the ops team that have just started. So we need to be focused on 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 the onboarding effectively and efficiently of, of those individuals. So what did so on, on that onboarding? Yeah. Um, uh, is there a, do you have like a three month onboarding program or, or what what does it look like to be onboarded as a, an AR or an operations of your business? Yeah. So uh, it's not a three month thing, um, but firstly. They need to understand sort of the DNA of the business. Yep. And, and I don't say that, uh, you know, I'm not trying to be sort of airy-fairy about that either. Like they need to understand the type of business that we are and, and the accountability that we want to have to each other and also to our referring firms and to our clients. Um, and then it will be – it will move on to process training. So typically assuming that it's an existing AR, yep. someone who's been inside the industry who's worked – so they come with experience – what we've realized is we used to just sort of, you know, give them a lot more free reign and, and they still wouldn't feel like they're micromanaged. But what we recognized is the sooner they can understand the process, the sooner they can fit in with the ops team, the sooner that they can get up to speed and it's better for them. It liberates them. Right? Yeah. So you've, you've, got to, you've got to, um, you know, people don't like change. But um, of all the successful practices that, that I've, I've spoken to, there, uh, you know, one of the common threads is is to get to get buy in as quickly as possible, or identify if there isn't going to be buy in. As Absolutely, as possible. and we believe you've got to live in the house before you renovate it. So a lot of a lot of people with experience will come to the business with really good ideas, and they would they are sincerely good ideas, or they've seen things looking through a different lens. So we need to encourage that and embrace that, but not at the start. So we'll say to them, you will see stuff that you'll question, why do we do that? You know, and maybe it's because we have a tech stack deficiency or maybe because there's other reasons that you can't see just yet. So after they've been onboarded and for a period of time, then we'll be encouraging them to tell us their perspective about that. And that's the, the meeting forums allow that so they can cascade up to yeah. whether it be Chris or, or, or Caroline and, and some ideas. Is that right? Yeah. And Chris is um, – so one of Chris's roles is is the fireside chats and he does that with everyone uh, twice a year. Um, you know, he'll typically do it – Well, up. there's a thing for Queenstown. We can probably go in winter. You'll have plenty of fireside chats. Yeah, well <laughs> – not sure how productive the fire chats, fireside chats are, but he, t- he tells me very good for culture. Um, and about your, your your business, you are a big substantial business, and you and being in life insurance, the byproduct of that is you see a lot of you see a lot of uh, human frailty and, and tragedy. Um, but but there is always that that silver lining that that you can produce by by you know effective advice and and underwriting and um, insurance liberables. In saying that. Does MBS have um, a charitable kind of um, uh, angle or, or anything that you specifically support? Yes, we do. Um, so we support a number of community uh, groups and teams, the sporting teams. So firstly, uh, I think the first time I ever saw you was I turned up to watch – I don't think I even turned up to watch. I might have been at a park that Mesa was playing soccer with you and you were wearing an MBS, you know – bad strip and I thought oh hang on a second how long have we been sponsoring this club for <laughs> how desperate must we be <laughs> <laughs> um, and we sponsor Melbourne University Cricket Club and, and different uh, uh, organisations that the team are involved with I am using a pen that says uh, Club 1054 which is for ovarian cancer research uh, which we support um, we have a team member who's uh, young daughter has Rett syndrome, so that's something that's close to our heart. And similarly, uh, my father-in-law passed away from motor neurons. So there's, there's lots of good causes that we get exposed to and that we want to contribute to. 
And 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 um and it sounds like almost all of them have, have had di- a direct um sort of uh, impact on individuals within in the group. Um, how do you then um decide and how do you organise that on a yearly basis? Do you do you is it reactionary? Which which if sure enough, which is a great thing as well. Is there proactivity? Um, you know what what what's how does it work? We're challenged by this. Um, yeah, it's, it's tough because every, like, being in life insurance in particular, you're seeing, you know, the best and worst of, 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 of scenarios every day. Yeah. And we've got 90 claims on the go, really, at any one time. Wow. So, yeah, it, it's been complete. We've, we've raised it a few times. Uh, we've thought about, you know, do we get people, maybe the employee of the quarter or what have you, to nominate a, yep. a charity of their choice or what have you. Um, we haven't landed on anything in particular. Uh, there are lots of good causes and, um, you know, people also have different causes that are, are closer to them yep, personally. Absolutely. You know, Brent McCullough, who's one of our partners, um, his family been heavily involved with Bear Cottage for a very long time, which is a wonderful cause. So, we've, you know, we've had tables at, at those events or what have you. Um, but, no, we haven't nailed down – a methodology or a format, and, and maybe you never do if 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 it, if, if, it, if it works. But um, um, look, the main thing is is that the, the common theme of of successful businesses that we interview on the engine room is that they are philanthropic, and why that is is that that people don't just want to work for a money machine; they want to work for people with heart. They they want to work for people that that you know that that have got some common interests that they can enjoy. Um, uh, and one of my questions is, you know, what's your 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 workplace philosophy i mean are you work from home are you work hybrid work i will ask that question but yeah. i mean against a backdrop of what sounded like about six geographical offices mm. so um if i was to to yet again come for a role for you is 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 it is it set in stone that i'm i'm, I'm working in the office or hybrid or what's what's your philosophy uh three days in the office um you know that's become pretty typical. You try and marry that up so people are in together or does absolutely it yeah, so okay. advisors are in tuesday yep. uh Probably not much happens Friday afternoon anyway, so we might as well have the team together and yep. we'll be uh, enjoying a, a longer lunch well, on the occasion. I think in your game, you caught when we talk to our partners. No, um, that doesn't happen anymore. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, well, I, I think, uh, mate, I miss those. I miss that, that era. But uh, yeah, when we have, like, the, it's nice for the team to be together and it's nice for the team to be together at maybe the end of the month or the end of the quarter or the end of the financial year. So Fridays are typically when. Most are in, yep. if not all. Um, and then for the advisors, Tuesdays is is, is a pretty much a non-negotiable. Yeah, and, and look, for the rest of the week, I mean, everyone post-COVID, everyone's got very good at being able to do their execution and, and you know, the world's going to look back and, at, at uh, how fearful, um, you know, bosses were of, of low productivity when in, in reality most people did the right thing. Yeah, well, it's, it's just the unknown, right? So we had Microsoft Teams at the time and we had Salesforce and so everyone really quickly could go home. Yep. Um, so that was fortuitous. Uh, you know, there, there's always a balance. You know, we recognize that it's harder to onboard people from home. We recognize that the younger people will learn stuff just by osmosis and and, um, and have the ability to go across the room and ask a question. Like if, if we were both working at home and I had less experience than you, I'm not going to pick up the phone 10 times in a day and ask you a little question. It's going to be embarrassing. Yeah. You know, so, but if you were just next to me or you were just across the way, I could, you know, go and have a chat to you or maybe I could go and ask someone else. So, certainly three days in the office is important for the development and progression of, of everyone and the connectivity to the to the firm. Absolutely. And look, when, whilst I'm, I'm sort of talking about how you, uh, you operate your business and your people, I'd be really keen on hearing what your genuine vision is for the life insurance component of this grand thing called financial services. Um, from an operations perspective, um, you know, you, you guys are hyper-specialised. Is that something that you see continuing? Do you see um, any of the super funds getting it right with their own distribution teams, for want of a better word? What, what's your thoughts of, of how this place is going to look in five years? Our view is, if you look at it very simply and think, you know, 2010, 2011, 2012, mm-hmm. think about what house prices in your local area were worth then. You know, they were, they were easily less than half or easily half or, yeah. or less. Yeah. I, In that period, I didn't know what buy now, pay later was. Of course, there's credit card debt. But 
we're cognizant that there is a like the personal indebtedness ratio and like the level of debt that has come on into the system relative to the level of income that people are paid is significant. And so the need for life insurance will exist, right? People are having children later, people are getting married later. The need for life insurance will continue. But when you have 15 consecutive negative points of regulatory intervention for a life insurance advice practice, distribution falls off a cliff. And it well, that's, that, that's a motherhood statement. 15 negative regulatory... Consecutive. Consecutive regulatory points of intervention. Yeah. Yeah. And so better people than I maybe foresaw all of them. But, you know, and this, this goes back to, you know, something that um, as a management team and for Chris and I, we, we believe in, you know, we're committed to, to growth and ambition, but we've got to be agile, right? We've got to be agile to change. We might not like it, but we've got to embrace it. And so going back to your question about where do we see it in the future, um, we absolutely see specialization. We see the need. I've already addressed that. The need continuing. So we think the market is going to grow, but it won't grow quickly. It won't grow quickly from ARs writing insurance. We had, I had a look at the the most recent June quarter uh, AFSL data, so the productivity per AR, and it's tiny. You know, the top 20 AFSLs and distributions, you know, most were distributing 10 grand in life insurance premium for the quarter per AR. There's nothing. So there's this long, long tail. Um, insurance companies and technology hopefully will help those who are doing part-time life insurance advice increase. But the true growth, Roxy, will come from specialists. And the reason being, if you're a wealth advisor, you, you may be seeing your clients once or twice or three times a year. So your capacity is limited. Whereas if you're a specialist risk advisor, you have a much greater capacity. You know, if you are providing a really comprehensive quality high portfolio, then maybe you're making adjustments every two, three, four years, particularly if you've got a more stable premium environment, right? So it's touching base, but it's not the same depth of, of uh, meeting and advice process that the wealth advisor would have. So, um, And even within, within advice, People are now getting hyper-specialized into industries that their clients are coming from, for instance. So I just think it's a growing up of the industry. And I think that, you know, being able to service, you know, one size fits all is pretty tough. And, yeah. and, and, and the, the, the platform of that is, is the case. But well, I just don't think you, sorry to interrupt you. I just, I don't believe that you can do as good a job as someone for your client. You might be able to do a portfolio structure that is excellent and, and on point. But how can you be adequately across the wealth creation and the wealth protection equally, right? If you invested all of your time in the wealth creation component of the business, then surely you're going to be better at that than if you spread yourself across multiple disciplines and you're dealing with different stakeholders. And um, as it turns out, commercially, um, quite a few people have agreed with your sentiment and have, have joined up with you guys over the years. So right now, um, you mentioned you uh, a few minutes ago that you've taken on a couple of new advisors. Mm. Um, given the scale of, of the business, um, are you you're still um, looking for ARs? Is there any sort of geographical area that you're interested in? Because, you know, part of this engine room podcast is is to take people on a journey. And thanks for all the listeners for, for, for being on here. Um, and for people then to go, you know what, that's the kind of business I can see my future in, um, but no point doing that if uh, the door's shut. So are you guys um, um, still looking for ARs or, or people in your in, on your business? Absolutely, we are. Yep. Yeah. Specifically? And so you got any specifics? Uh, people who want to do it and want to create a career and want, you know, recognize uh, the value in being part of a, a team where you're working with peers that are in the specialist I think that's well. important because so many advice practices have got one person in life insurance. Yeah. And I think what you're intimating, it can be quite lonely when you sit in a team meeting and everyone's talking about investments and they get to you and they're kind of, well, I'm talking to myself a bit. Yeah. And so at a business level, we control the flow of distribution. You know, we have the business to business relationships. So we don't require advisors to get out and knock on doors and, you know, wear the leather off the shoes. Um, so we've got the distribution component to support 
the advisor. We've got obviously an existing uh, client group as well. Um, and then we'll provide the advisors with the right infrastructure around them, you know, on the tech perspective, advisor associates, client services, so they can be focused on advising. Um, we've had a number of join us that, that are good advisors and have come from environments that it wasn't a specialization. And, you know, they've been quite vocal internally, which is great for our team to hear that this is different. You know, having a bit more scale, we'd hope to, to do six and a half, seven million in new business this year. And so, um, the reason I say that is it, it, the insurance companies recognize that, um, that the market distribution is down and we need them to recognize there are firms like ours that are growing and that what we need is them to help our clients more meaningfully and better. And that can manifest in multiple ways. But having dedicated underwriters, having streamlined processes internally and externally, you know, having a claims team, having new business support, having some tech accountability and integration, these all, all these sorts of things make it a bit easier for our advisors to manage the client relationship and to manage the policy portfolios. I see that... Um, uh you know, when I look at engine rooms out there, they are all different, but they are all sort of looking to to achieve a couple of things. One is the ultimate outcome for for the client. Um, but increasingly, if you are giving your team the platform for them to be their best self for them to achieve, well, at record levels of unemployment, they're going to find the company that is. Yeah. Um, so and, what- and and we have you know we've just had two new partners come on board as as at one July, and other people in the business see that. And, and so do their, you know, colleagues or, or friends in other firms or, the, you know, we all go to the same functions that, that, that industry groups might put on. And, and so that sort of is helpful as well to our momentum. Drew, it's been a real pleasure. I've known you for many years. I, I, I was there when um, uh, you guys made the decision in 2015 to scale up. Um, I think at the time uh, you sort of said, well, you know, we've got to go for it. You've got to do it. Um, you know, right. There was sort of a situation where commissions were, were up in the air and, 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 um, and I'd like to congratulate you for backing yourself and backing each other. And, and that, that vibe comes across to the team, right? So, you know, there's no one in your team who, who doubts that, that, that the leadership in that business is not going to be on point and it's going to be completely what they bought into. So, uh, well done doing that. Well done for supporting the life insurance industry. And more importantly, well done for being on the bloody engine room. Thank you, mate. Thank you very much, much, Drew. Cheers. Thanks, buddy.